It was August of 2012, the first time I met Ken. He was here for the Greatest Awakening Conference, Danny Stain. Part Bowman. three. Part three. There's been many Greatest Awakenings. That's what prophets do. And uh, he was in a time of transition at that time. And I remember him sitting back here in the back with Aaron. And you guys were discussing what the next chapter of your life was going to be. You know, should you were wondering, do I really dive back into ministry? Is that what I'm supposed to do? And it was actually Aaron Evans, we just did his memorial service up in, in New Hampshire, uh, who told me to bring Ken back. And we've had Ken back, I think, just about every year since then. And we have watched him grow. Um, I have watched him sh <laughs> Well, yes, in all the ways, as have we all. Debbie and I were talking about doing the cleanse this week, you know, but then we got to cook out on Saturday, and then we're going to Maine tomorrow, and there's always something to eat. But, you know, and I was thinking about, you know, we, there was the time where we were actually talking about uh, toying with the idea of, of bringing Ken out and, and having him being on staff, part-time while he travels. And I was thinking about this last night. This was years ago. It's not now, guys. Knock it off. Because in those transitions, I mean, there was multiple, multiple years of struggle. And as I was just sitting last night in my man cave contemplating, and I really felt if we had done that, you would not be in the space where you are today. All of the fire, all of the struggle, not that you're without struggles now, but everything that you went through and the tears and the weeping and the misunderstandings, all were in the fire that fashioned you to be where you are now. And this weekend, the teachings that you released this weekend bar none, are the most poignant teachings that you've released in this house to date. And so if you did not see, get online, get your Bibles out, and take notes of what was released here this weekend. Because in, I'm telling you, in these teachings were the keys to unlock you from the blockages in life that you have not quite understood yet. And he laid it out. It's in the word. It's just, it's really just in the word. But he put it out there. And so for me, I'm jealous. I'm jealous for this house. I'm jealous for this region to be, as uh, Verna said a year ago, to be unstuck. And this right here will unstick you even though the font is, dude, it won't, will you, you know, maybe I'm just too proud. So stretch out your hands. It works without the glasses. The glasses are for distance. God bless you. Just, just rub it in, Ken. Never mind. Put your hands down. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. We're family here. We're family. <laughs> Jesus, we love you. We love your family. All of our quirks and quirkiness and our differences. And you said if you'd be lifted up, you'd draw everybody to you. And well, here we are. And we honor Ken and Beth, his kids, his family, and what they have endured as a household to see the things that we have been able to see around the world by you, through you, to you, but through Ken, your son. And yes, he's a father in the faith. faith. Yes, he's an apostle in the faith. But first, he's a son. He's been given that spirit of adoption. It's been marked by royalty. And God, I thank you for the fire 
that you have brought him through for such a time as this. We receive him and we release him to speak your word today. And we bless him with the full measure of the blessing of this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys give an awesome bridge and New England welcome to almost Dr. Ken Fish. I'm not even sure how to follow that, but thank you. <laughs> I, feel, I feel encouraged and honored. All right, well, so we've talked a little bit uh, over the weekend, if you were at the event, um, we've talked about uh, crossing a line of demarcation and keys to Joshua's victory uh, in life, not just any specific victory in battle. And then uh, last night we addressed the problem of unbelief, which I think by the time we were done with that, it was pretty clear that we all have a problem with it because we live in the United States and because we're human. Um, and this morning I want to uh, finish it out with um, a message on prayer, which could seem like mom and apple pie, but um, the fact of the matter is Western Christians don't pray enough, period. And we're often busy with very many things, and if that line sounds familiar, it should. I'm deliberately quoting what Jesus said to Martha. And, um, and the other thing I've noticed in that the way Western Christians pray is it's pretty lame most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. And so, if you've got your Bibles, uh, open them to Second Samuel, and we're going to look at a, a brief passage, and then we're going to look at a couple of others as we go. Second Chance Samuel chapter 5, it says this, starting in verse 17, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Paratzim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore the name of that place is called Baal Paratzim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. Now I'll add here, I'm going to keep reading, but I'll add here, if you look at the parallel account that's found in 1 Chronicles 14, it says not just that they carried them away, but they burned their gods. Very important point. They burned their gods. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come against them, opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself. For then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. <clears throat> well, this is a story about battle, but it's also a story about spiritual warfare. Because we don't really have spiritual eyes in the West, they've largely been blinded um, through many of the processes that I described last night. What we don't fully understand is that, how many people here have heard of the Nephilim? It's kind of a thing these days, yeah. I'm not going to teach on the Nephilim, so don't worry. But I will say this, there were more than one race of giants in those epochs of the earth, and one of them was known as the Rephaim. And so this valley where the Philistines chose to engage David, you know, good commanders always pick the place of battle that will give them what they think is the winning advantage. May or may not work out, but, but that's always what they try to do. And so the Philistines came, and they came to the Valley of Rephaim because the Valley of Rephaim was the Valley of the Giants. It was the Valley of, we could say the Nephilim, but they weren't the Nephilim. They were another race of these mixed, uh, mixed creatures. And so David inquires of the Lord, and he gets two different battle plans on two different days. This is analogous to, but not identical to, what happened with Moses. The first time the Lord wanted him to draw water from the rock, he told him, strike the rock. And he did, and the water came. 
The second time the Lord wanted him to draw water from the rock, the Lord said, speak to the rock, don't strike it. He doesn't actually say don't strike it. He just says speak to it. And Moses again strikes the rock, and the Lord says, for this one thing you will not enter the promised land. So this matter of hearing God is critical, and David at least learned from the story of Moses, and he inquired twice, rather than assuming that what worked on the first time around would necessarily work on the second time around. There's a huge life lesson in that for all of us. It should be obvious enough I won't waste time. It's not that it'd be wasting time, it's that I'm racing against the clock because it's Sunday morning. So I won't use valuable time to comment on what should be obvious. Well, all of this happens through prayer. And it's interesting when David um, de uh, defeats the Philistines, he names the place Baal Peratzim. Now again, you wouldn't necessarily know why that's significant unless you know a little bit of Hebrew. I'm sorry? Well, yes, but, but more than that. So don't preempt me. Let me do the sermon. So the name of the Philistine god is Baal, and it means Lord. And what David is doing is he's mocking the Philistine highest god, Baal. And he is saying, well, <laughs> my Lord is greater than your Lord. And that should bring back kind of an echo of Psalm 2. The Lord said to my Lord sit at my feet and uh, sit at my side until I make the enemies your footstool. That's what's going on here. But he doesn't just call him Baal Paratz, which is very important. Paratz would be one breakthrough, but Paratzim is multiple breakthroughs. And so what David does is he calls the Lord the Lord of many breakthroughs. Now that's a name for God that we don't tend to use very much. He is our father, absolutely. I call him father regularly when I pray. It's my most common name that I use when I address God. But, but the Lord of many breakthroughs is one of the biblical names of God. And I don't think many of us have grasped that concept deeply enough in our time. Partially because we're told that you know, we shouldn't sound too aggressive. Uh, partially because people don't understand this concept that's going on. There are a lot of reasons why, but David's name for God, at least here, is the Lord not just of breakthrough, but of many breakthroughs. And with that, we have to understand that when we pray, anytime we pray, however we pray, wherever we pray, about whatever we pray, we are not merely praying to pray. And I think a lot of people do that. They think they will be heard for their many words. Somebody famous said that, but you can fact check me on it. And so we're not simply praying to pray. We are praying for breakthrough. We are always praying for breakthrough. We want to breach the enemy's lines and, and overwhelm him and defeat him utterly. That is what we want to do. And in the story of David here, there are two different strategies that are employed. Now, to pray unto breakthrough so that we too can enter in not just as a name that we pulled out of the pages of scripture because but rather because it's been our life experience that god is the god of overwhelming breakthrough on our behalf that only arises from having had a few victories under your belt now david had had many victories under his belt but now as the king he's just been anointed and the philistines basically say if we can cut the head off of this kingdom right now we will have no further problems from the israelites they knew what david could do they'd faced him on the battlefield before and they're thinking let's get him while he's just forming his government before he can really solidify everything and so they go up against him, and David wisely draws back into the stronghold, a reinforced place, so he, has, he can buy a little time, and he can pray, and he can seek the Lord. And then he goes to prayer. Now, years ago in the Vineyard Movement, I would say, um, you know, John had a desire to implant prayer in our midst. And on the one hand, he did, praying for healing, um, prophecy, deliverance, th this got embedded in our culture. But this idea of praying unto breakthrough, this was not something that we were particularly good at, and John knew it. So I'm not telling tales out of school and you know, dissing the dead. But um, he, he found multiple ways of trying to sow that into our culture. At one time he brought in Larry Lee, who was a pastor from the greater Dallas area, specifically Rockwall, Texas. And Larry came and taught on prayer and everybody showed up and you know we kind of learned to pray Larry's way for a while and 
after a while, Larry went away, and then he brought in Mike Bickle and Leonard Ravenhill, and we learned to pray the Mike Bickle and Leonard Ravenhill way. And all of these were useful and helpful to one degree or another, but this thing of group prayer, this thing of praying unto breakthrough, it never really caught on in our church. And I would say to this very day, the Vineyard Movement remains a largely prayerless movement if defined in this way. I'm not saying people in the Vineyard never pray, and I'm not saying there aren't other methods and modes of prayer, but I'm specifically focusing on this kind of breakthrough prayer. That's what we're talking about here. And so, um, you know, time went on, and we find ourselves now in the place where in our day, in our time, and specifically with our own lives and the ministries God has called us to, it, there's like there's a word that's gone out in the land and I'm hearing it everywhere I go sometimes the word of the Lord will come to me in a meeting like in a worship time like we just had other times I'm listening to the speakers and I'm listening to what they're talking about and I'm like wow I'm listening to a group of Methodists and they sound exactly like the Pentecostals I was just with last week and they sounded just like the Anglicans I was with two weeks before and they sound like the Lutherans I was with a week before that and so what I realized is that there's a word in the land. It's on the air, it's in the water, it's God's trying to awaken us to the need for breakthrough prayer. And so if our passion is to break through to purpose, um, and by purpose, we already defined that on Friday night, to be the wider purposes of God. This is not about you and whether you get a better house or why you don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. I mean, these things matter. They do matter. The Lord cares very much about the small details of our lives. But his order is always, if you seek first my kingdom, then I will give you what you want. But if you seek your kingdom, it's all going to fall over, and you'll wonder why these principles that you see in the scriptures don't work. So we need breakthrough prayer in order that God's kingdom would advance, in order that we would be engaged in the wider purpose of God. And so if our passion is to, is to break through, to uh, bring power, to see power released, then prayer has to be joined with passion to see the power of God moving. And as I say that, I am very much specifically speaking of prayer in an intercessory manner and more than likely in group settings. Now, I am aware people can intercede on their own, but there is strength in numbers and there is a group dynamic. And just last week when I was in Ohio with a bunch of Methodists, um, we had a lot of different speakers from around the world. And the thing that was interesting to me was the white people from the U.S. spoke of prayer in one way, and it was all very much me and God and what happens in my office or my prayer closet or by my bed or whatever. And all of the Koreans and the Africans, and I'm aware there are many countries in Africa, I'm just kind of generically painting the world here, uh, but the Koreans and the Africans and uh, the people that had somehow gotten out of China, and there are many pieces of China too, um, they were all talking about what happened in corporate prayer and how when one prays it fuels another. And so it was a very different dynamic as you listen to the words they were speaking. And so I am talking about primarily group intercessory prayer and it can happen obviously in our families, although often it won't because of, I don't know, awkwardness in family dynamics. Uh, it could happen with our friends, could happen with our church colleagues. I know one group in Houston that I visit every year, and uh, there are 12 churches represented by 14 people. Wow. And uh, they come together all the time in prayer and Bible study. Uh, they all have their own churches. They're loyal to their churches. They love the churches they go to. We've got kind of one of everything. You name it, it's probably got one. And we had a cat show over at the hotel this weekend, and there was one of everything of that, too. <laughs> So <laughs> it's like herding cats, right? <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so, but, but the point is these people in Houston, man, they get after it. And they, most of them are actually quite wealthy and upper class, and they have all of the mannerisms and characteristics of the elite um, when they're at work or even when they're in social settings. But when they come together to pray all bets are off. And you just might think that you were in the middle of Zaire or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the way these people get after it and pray. So what is breakthrough prayer? Well, 
as I just pointed out, one of the names of God is the Lord of Breakthrough. And David called the Lord by this name both to mock the Philistines as well as to signify what the Lord had done for him. Now, the Philistines, as I already said, had come very close to stopping David from assuming the throne. They had, they had gone into the Valley of Rephaim, which means they understood that there was a spiritual component in what they were doing. They weren't simply going to war. They were, but they were doing more than that. They were calling on the powers of the fallen ones, these race of giants, these spiritual beings, and that's why they went to the Valley of Rephaim. They could have chosen to join battle anywhere, but they specifically chose that one. And so David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, I will go with you. And David went out against them, not once but twice, and he said, the Lord broke through my enemies like a flood. Now think about pictures that you've seen of floods. There have been a few of them of late, including in my home state of California. And what happens? It's an overwhelming thing where dikes are breached, roads are overwhelmed, houses are swept away. That's the kind of overwhelming victory that we are looking for from the Lord, in the purposes of God. You'll get yours because that's called the spoils of war. But do not put yours at the front. His goes first. We got to be really clear about that one at all times. And power in that kind of battle comes through prayer-filled passion or passion-filled prayer. I don't care which way you say it, but you need both words in there, passion and prayer. Those are the two words you're after. And as I said, it's often corporate. So um, once when I was in another country, we encountered um, significant opposition as we were uh, attempting to do the work that we were sure the Lord had sent us to do. And, and it's important that I say we were sure, because, you know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know why God sent me here. Well, then you probably shouldn't even be there. Or before you do anything, what you should do is, my daughter's an army ranger, um, set up a perimeter call a prayer meeting in the center of the perimeter and let the sentries keep guard that no one approaches and wipes out your prayer meeting, but figure it out before you go out and engage in maneuvers. And we talked about this on Friday night, so if you weren't here, that message will cover that idea. But um, anyway, so I'm in this country, we encountered this significant opposition, nothing is working, the Holy Spirit wasn't moving as I was accustomed to seeing, and so I called the team to prayer. and. Uh, as I remember it, I had about 10 people on my team with me, and they were all really, really, like, tuned up people. They, they got it. They were skilled evangelists. One person, typical week, leads 10 to 12 people to the Lord every week, week in, week out, with monotonous regularity. Um, you know, they heal the sick. They, 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 they just, they've got game. They're like SEAL Team 6 in the spirit. And so, um, but we weren't getting breakthrough, even though, you know, we had a good, solid team. So we began praying fervently and passionately, and we were spending roughly two hours a day doing this. Now, the other night, Friday night, I had you guys come up, and I said, I want you to pray, and don't stop praying till I tell you to stop praying. And still, it kind of... And a couple times, I had to say, hey, keep praying. And so you kind of picked it up a bit, but it kind of fell away quickly. When I say we pray for two hours a day, it was like two hours a day of, oh God! People are on their face, they're pounding the floor, they're walking around, they're decreeing, they're praying, they're quoting scripture, they're prophesying, they're at like full volume. And if you, if you were trying to do it with us on Friday night, many of you, the reason you kind of trailed out is it gets tiring. We aren't used to talking at that level of intensity whether by energy level or volume, in our normal conversation. But anyway, for two hours a day, we're like, Mah. and so we prayed and prayed with passion and fervor, and we found breakthrough. But let me be clear, it didn't happen the first day. It didn't happen the second day. It didn't happen the third day. It was on the sixth of eight days that we breached the enemy's line, and when it happened, all heaven broke loose. I remember the night that it happened, there was a, I don't know what it was, something flicked across the room and hit a guy that we'd prayed for just in a private session who had a fatal blood disease. It literally knocked him off his feet and threw him back about 15 feet. He crashed to the floor, taking all of his elders with him. The next morning, he ran down to the clinic, got a blood test, totally healed. He's alive to this day, and I'm speaking in his church this December. 
three people in the front row just got right up out of their wheelchairs and began dancing and pushed them back up the aisle. Three more people with hearing aids ran up to the stage and threw their hearing aids on the stage. That's what it looked like. But let me be clear, for six days, we were engaged in bloody, muddy, slogging through combat with no ground being taken. New England, are you listening? This is a key to breakthrough, and it is something that everybody kind of backs away from. We think we have better things to do than to pray, but if our purpose is breakthrough, if our purpose is the wider purposes of God, this is something we must recover, and let me say it again, lose your white middle class respectability. Lose it. Put it down the toilet, at least when you're praying. You can be that when you go to work and carry on with your normal functions, but when you get down to praying like this, this is like giving birth. And, you know, one thing about giving birth, it's a glorious outcome, but it is not a pretty process. Are we all communicating? Yes. Okay, so in Acts 1.14, they had a need for a breakthrough. And so they were, we're going to go to Acts 1.14 now. Um, it says they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount uh, called Olivet, the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away, and when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were with one accord. That's a critical point we're going to come back to, but just note it for now. They're in one accord. There's a unity there. And the, the word in Greek is homo thumadon. You hear the word homo in it. Well, we all know what homo means. It means one. So, homothumadon, they have one will. That's what one accord means. And they were devoting themselves, giving themselves over. We might even say religiously, which is part of our problem, because everything that's come about actually comes from the headwaters of this. It's not one of the best things out of the vineyard. The vineyard was always like, we don't want to be religious. And that was because a lot of the founders of the vineyard had been in religious systems that were actually quite rigid and sometimes a bit critical and so forth. And... Um, and so when they broke away from that, they said, we don't want to be religious. But, you know, one of the other uses of the word religious, and you'll hear people say it, it's like they're very religious about following their devotions. They're very religious about taking communion. They're very religious about prayer. And that doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation unless your ear is tuned that way. And what it means is people who practice their piety with great regularity, with faithfulness and consistency and predictability. And so religious somehow got mingled, and it's been a number of years since all that began. And whether you're in the HIM stream or the Bethel stream or the Global Awakening stream or the Upper Room or Elevation, or I don't care, any of them, this idea of religious is really a negative, negative, negative term. But this says they were devoting themselves to prayer. They were religious about their prayer in the best sense of the word. And together with the women and Mary and the mother of James and his brothers. And so the 11, they, they're, they're looking for something. What are they looking for? They're looking for that promise of the Holy Spirit. They probably have a reasonable idea of what this means because Jesus would have instructed them. But they don't know exactly what this means because it hasn't happened to them yet. So they're pressing in for something they don't even really know what it is fully. And so they clearly were at this time where they had become men of prayer. Now, between Ascension Day and Pentecost is 10 days. So this wasn't an overly long period, but they were devoting themselves. They were, they were fully given over to it for 10 days in seeking the Lord. And I can remember as a younger man, um, I was involved in a, a youth movement, a church movement, and uh, we had something called Concerts of Prayer. Dave Bryant was the one that was behind all this. But this was where we would come together for extended periods of time to seek the Lord with fervor. Not these kind of boring, milquetoast evangelical prayer meetings where it's, you know, deader than a doornail and everyone's like, you know, God, we pray you'd move. And, yes, oh Lord, I pray you'd do this in Jesus' name. That's not the kind of praying we are talking about. There is no breakthrough in that. So these 11 had become men of prayer but to enter into prayer in the way that they did implies that they had a rhythm or a pattern to it. They had a consistency to it. And they'd also developed comfort with each other, which means both that they liked each other, but they also were not afraid to let it all hang out in each other's company. That doesn't exist in a lot of modern churches. 
People are very awkward about letting their guard down too much, and depends on the church, but, you know, it's more like a social club. So this kind of praying presupposes that the dynamic of koinonia is in place. I like what Paul has said every meeting we've had here this weekend. Uh, we just come together. Ken happens to be here. But he's, what he's really saying is, you know, we have a dynamic here. We are people, and we're trying to build into that type of koinonia. But how much more koinonia-ized, I did make that word up on the fly, how much more koinonia-ized could we become in order that we would pray with reckless abandon in front of one another? I think that's an important question. So they, they go after this, this thing, and, and after 10 days, when the day of Pentecost had fully come upon them, um, something like tongues of fire appears over their heads, and you know the story. So they broke through. They got what they had come for. But it did take them 10 days of praying. Later on, these same guys end up in a problem with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. They get called in for having healed the man at the gate beautiful. And so they go before the Sanhedrin, the same people who had killed Jesus. So I mean, I'd say it's kind of a high-risk situation. They're ultimately released. And it says when they were released, they went to their friends. Right there, you can see that they've become, become quite koinonia-ized. They go to their friends, and they reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. I'm in Acts 4 now. And when they heard it, watch this, they lifted their voices together to God. Now, lifted their voices, there's only one way to interpret that. When you lift your voice, you are raising your voice. That means you're getting loud. This is not, oh, Lord, we pray that you deal with those wicked men. Squeeze, squeeze, your turn to pray, Kurt, Teresa. Yeah. <laughs> and it says not only that they lifted their voices, but they did it together. There's that same idea of homo thumidon. Now, in a lot of circles, people are afraid to do this because they have been taught erroneously, I believe, that it is indecent and out of order to pray simultaneously because nobody can hear what everybody else is saying. And with that, you're sort of speaking on top of each other, and that's indecent and out of order. But can I just suggest to you there's another way of thinking about this? And what that other way of thinking about it is, is this, that when there is this one accord type dynamic going on, while you might not be able to hear specifically what everybody else is praying, everybody is praying the same thing. Yes. And that's very much in order. Because that's where unity is. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is unity. And where there is unity, there is the Spirit of the Lord. In fact, the Scripture says how precious it is when brothers dwell together in unity. We should say brothers and sisters, but you get the idea. It is like oil running down upon the beard, upon Aaron's beard. And there the Lord, there at that place, the Lord commands a blessing. He, he directs the blessing to come down forevermore. It's not just a one-shot deal. It creates a, it creates a virgence in the spirit that becomes an open portal for good that can be refreshed and where more anointing can come. And so we see them operating this way in the New Testament context. And it says they lifted their voice together. So when they lift their voices together and they get loud, I don't think they're getting loud just to get loud. You can do that, but that's just flesh. This is the kind of loud because that happens when you're genuinely excited. So again, one of the things I love about Boston is I love all three of your major sports teams. There aren't many cities in America I can say that of, including my own, Los Angeles. But I think the Red Sox are awesome. I think the Patriots are awesome. And I love the Celtics, always have. A friend of mine bought them a few years ago, which was interesting. <laughs> he, had a little, he had a little bit of money. Um, but I'm still waiting to go to the Sox with you one of these, one of these summers. Um, but anyway, in Beantown... When your team's on top, what do you do? You just come right out of your seats. Yeah! There's no forcing it. There's no flashing it. You guys are just, you're just on fire excited. And that's what we're talking about when we say they got loud. It's not false excitement that gets worked up. Like when maybe a worship leader says, Come on, everyone. Let's stand up and really praise the Lord. That's not what we're talking about here. 
Let's give Jesus a shout and a clap offering. I mean, there's a time for shouting and clap offerings, but it's a lot more authentic when it's spontaneous and it erupts out of the people rather than somebody saying, come on, let's do it now. And Does that make sense to everybody? You know, Amy, every time I've done a message, your phone goes off. It must be that one person that's your authorized person coming through. <laughs> Out she goes. Let's shame her some more. <laughs> okay, so this kind of enthusiasm, this loudness comes from excitement, that sense of overcoming a challenge, just as David did in the Valley of the Raphaim. Except when we're in Beantown, we're talking about beating the other sports team, whichever one it is. And so it wells up from the depths of your soul. And it's because you're engaged with the very thing you're watching. If you're watching a sporting event, you're like, okay. And if you're in the things of God, it's a similar sort of dynamic. It may not be quite as fast moving as a, you know, a basketball game or something, but, but you get the idea. And so especially in a context like this, it's very easy to understand what we're describing. If, if you're in a town where their teams never win, I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, another dynamic where you might see this is if you've ever been at a rock concert or other concert where the, the, the performing group plays that song, whatever it is, or that piece. You know, you could be at the Philharmonic and they could play Beethoven's Fifth or something, but everybody's like, ah, they just go there, right? And so, again, people come right up out of their seats. They're shouting, they're screaming, they're chanting. In a concert, they probably have their fingers up in a V for victory. Um, in the old days, they would have gotten out their cigarette lighters and everyone would have lit the flame. Now you get your phone out and you turn on the light. But it's the same sort of effect. So that's what Luke is describing in these passages. And that's not what a typical prayer meeting looks like in most churches, even so-called renewed or third wave, fourth wave, river stream type churches. Instead, people are more focused on being cool, dialed back, unreligious. And it's actually causing us not to find the breakthroughs we need. Now, let me say it again. We're not trying to stir up the flesh here. What we're trying to do is get so excited about God and his purposes that all of this erupts out of us naturally. Let's not put the cart before the horse. So it depends on the church. Sometimes they don't pray together much, if at all. Um, that's unfortunate, but it reflects the individualism of modern Western civilization. And yet, in contrast to it, much of the praying that we see in the New Testament is corporate rather than individual. Note that I said much, not all. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with individual prayer. And there are times when you absolutely want to be praying alone. But right now, what I'm trying to recapture is this dynamic of group breakthrough prayer, so I'm necessarily highlighting it. At other times, uh, their praying might seem pained, maybe even bored. Uh, there's very little expectation, and whether it's the body language, the voice tone, the energy level in the room, these betray that lack of enthusiasm and warmth, and not much comes of these prayer meetings either. And people generally loathe them, and they avoid attending them, and they peter out, and they kind of die, and... It gets removed from the church bulletin, and nobody even notices that there's no prayer anymore. Um, or if they come, they do it out of a sense of duty or guilt. And then there's this third category that I kind of mimicked a few moments ago. They pray together, but the sound of the praying is muted, sheepish, a bit like a corporate board meeting where nobody dares raise their voice because volume is the cardinal sin in formal and proper settings. Now, again, we're not screaming here. I mean, I guess we could be if we're excited enough. But we're certainly not angry. But rather, we're allowing our passion to come loose. And passion is really important. If you've ever seen soldiers on a battlefield, whether ancient or modern, well, if they're, doing, if they're trying to be stealthy, they might not be screaming. But traditionally in war, soldiers yell as they go into battle because it, it brings them a sense of unity and power. And so, um, and so this idea of raising our voices and praying together simultaneously, um, this is actually part and parcel of what it looks like. Now, let's be clear. I'm not advocating for poor manners, uh, but I am advocating for a shift in the way we pray together. 
and then we can go back to having good manners when we're doing other things. But I'm, right now we're trying, trying to reaccess this, this tool, this gift that God has given us and, and you know, use it the right way. So um, with this, there's a kind of confidence that emerges. So we're not, again, i just emphasize it one more time. I'm not talking about manufactured enthusiasm, but one that comes from an ongoing and deep abiding confidence in God. It's a confidence that if we pray, he hears us, and then we know that we have what we have prayed for. That comes straight out of 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And by the way, the John who wrote those words was present in the prayer meeting in Acts 4 that I just described. So he's taking something of that and dropping it into his general letter to all the churches on earth with the idea that, hey guys, you can actually find that place of overwhelming breakthrough in prayer. He knew the power of it from his own experience. And so it's a confidence that our prayers have the ability to move heaven and earth, and it breeds confident praying. And that confidence may spill over into excitement, volume, and the sense of the imminent release of God's power, and it will literally make the earth move. It says in Acts 4 that when they were praying, uh, or when they had finished, the place where they were praying was shaken. Now, I've only had it happen a couple of times in my life, but I've actually seen situations, been present, where we had praying like this, and we weren't on fault lines, um, or in Southern California, seismically active zones, and in the aftermath of those prayer meetings, literally the room shook. The floor was shaking, the pillars were shaking, the roof was shaking. It died down presently. It's a little bit unsettling, but at the same time, you realize we broke through. Yes. Now, I'm not saying you'll have that happen every time. I only have two stories like that, but most people have zero. And so this Greek word, homothumadon, that I've already called out, it's a unique word. Um, it's a compound of two words that means to rush along in unison. And so when we're praying in this way, there's a, there's a power and a force behind it. It's like being on a river in a canoe or a raft, and the current is taking you along. But again, everybody's got the same focus, the same intention. And the image is musical. There's a number of notes that are sounded that... Although different notes are sounding, they harmonize, they come together. This is what happens in a symphony. You know, whether you've got violins or violas or you've got trumpets or whatever they are, they're all tuned to the oboe and they're all able to come together with one sound that, that's going on. And so this word homothumadon occurs 12 times in the New Testament. Ten of them come in the book of Acts. Now, if you've ever been in a prayer meeting of this kind, you know the effect, and if you haven't, um, mere descriptions actually won't convey it. I've tried to do that as I've been describing this, but if you've never been in it, you, all I can say is you got to try it to know what this is really like. But it's like being in the midst of a symphony or maybe a fugue in which certain notes and refrains recur, rising and falling, and it goes without saying that the instruments are in tune together. I just mentioned the oboe as the instrument to which everybody else tunes. And there's an underlying unifying theme, something to which the music returns continually while at various points the music branches out and explores other themes. It's complex, it's melodious, it's all woven together in a rich intricacy, and as the prayer goes up, all present feel as though they are themselves caught in something greater than themselves. It's like being sucked up into the flames of a blast furnace. And that's really the right kind of language we want to be using because in a furnace like this, the flames are so hot that they can melt anything known to mankind, including steel or tungsten or pick your favorite metal. It's irresistible. And let me say it, nothing can withstand this kind of prayer. Nothing. But again, many of us don't really understand the power of this sort of thing. And we aren't, we aren't walking in it. And it can be very awkward to... So find the ignition switch and start using it. But I remember one time I was teaching on prayer, not this message, but, but this idea of prayer, and I was in the state of Western Australia on the Indian Ocean, and um, there were a bunch of people uh, you know, in this meeting, and they had that room configured in round tables, and there were maybe eight seats at each, every table or something. Maybe it was ten. But you know, we had these tables. And so I said to everybody in the room, when it came time for ministry time, I said, I'm not going to pray for you. We're going to do this. 
And so I said, I want all of you to come together at your table, and I want you to get the mind of the Lord on what you are going to pray about. And I said, I don't, we don't need this table to agree with that table to agree with that table with that table. We just need that table to be in unison, and that one to be in unison, and that one and that one. If you guys can find unison on, on, at each table, and you pray into this thing that the Lord has placed on you to pray, then you're going to find breakthrough. And I said, and here's what I want you to do. We are not praying to pray. We're done with that. We are praying unto breakthrough. So I do not want you to stop until you believe as a group that you have found the point of breakthrough. You have breached the enemy's line. You have found the salient is what a military strategist would call it. And now the Lord has gone through like water and you have the overwhelming victory. And I said, don't stop until you find that. I'm not going to modulate this. You guys do it for yourselves. But do write down what each of you is praying for. <clears throat> so we did that, and the whole exercise took us um, maybe half an hour or so. And uh, everybody reported in on what their table was. And, and I will tell you, every single table that felt that they had found the point of breakthrough, they literally had found the point of breakthrough. And the most dramatic one of all, the most dramatic one of all was the table right here off to my left, essentially on the right side of the room. And they had felt the burden of the Lord come on them for the purpose of dealing with the drug problem in Western Australia. Western Australia has a gigantic coastline that is essentially undefended. They don't really have a coast guard, and ships come in and go out, and usually they're just little boats. And, uh, I mean, they, they have airplanes in the air and stuff, but there's just so much of it going on that they can't control their own border on the Indian Ocean. And sometimes they'll go around to the Southern Ocean on the south end, and so they'll deliver drugs there. And the net effect of it is that one in three households in the entire western state of Western Australia, one in three, at least at that time, it may have gone up now, um, is affected with illegal drug use and particularly opioids. And so it's literally corroding the inside of their society. And so that table right there, they felt the burden of the Lord for that thing. And so they prayed until they felt that they had secured the breakthrough. Well, it was a multi-day event. And the next morning, before any of us could show up for the meeting the next day, the front page of the paper reported that the AFP, the Australian Federal Police, had just had the largest drug bust in the history of Western Australia. They had taken in more than 500 tons of methamphetamine and they'd taken 200 people to jail who were part of this trafficking ring. What did they do? They called upon Baal Paratzim to breach the enemy's line, and the Lord poured through like water. If that can happen in Western Australia, it can happen in, Aust in uh, Boston as well. Absolutely. So the unison that's presupposed for Homo Thumadon to work, it's not artificial, it's not an imposed unity that many of us have known throughout our lives when people have you know, put something down over the top, um, whether inside the church or out of it, by the way. And one, one of the things that people often struggle with is being able to trust because of that kind of abuse. That's why koinonia-izing the people is so critical for this to work. Because otherwise, if you just say, all right, let's all be in unison, everyone's like, yeah, right. I've heard that before. So it can't be commanded from above. It's not the suppression of people's wills to create an artificial, humanly imposed unity. It's the enlivening of people's souls in which they come together voluntarily with a common understanding and a common purpose and a common vision. And so... David speaks of it, and I quoted this earlier in Psalm 133. David speaks of this. Who called him the Lord of Breakthrough? David. So this is one of the fundamental keys to David's victories in all that he did. Not just what happened in the valley of Baal Paratim. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the beard running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Sion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing forevermore. Well, the last thing we've got to say here as we wrap this up is that um, when we think of this kind of praying, it requires passion. 
Voices lifted together in unity conveys passion. There's great power in passion. Now, in America today, passion puts people off. I've, in my own life, more than once run into trouble because people are, they don't know what to do when I get passionate. They think I'm angry and I'm a little unhinged. I'm usually not angry and I'm usually not unhinged, but I am passionate. I don't know where it came from, I don't know where I learned to do that, but, but anyway, I know that there is power in passion. So voices lifted together in the way that I described, it conveys passion, and it's, um, it, for passion to be real, it almost necessarily requires an open display of motion. Think of two young people who have found one another. There's a lot of passion there, isn't there? There's a lot of other things too, but we'll just stick with the passion part. So they're, they're ardent for each other, and they, they want to know everything about each other, and they want to spend time together, and they're pretty, you know, shameless about speaking out how they feel for each other, whether they're posting on Facebook or talking to their friends or whatever it might be. But in our society, passion is basically forbidden. The only place it might be allowed, and even here it's going away, is at funerals, and maybe weddings and births. Maybe you're allowed to be passionate there. But, you know, I, I know people who have been openly weeping, say, at funerals, and they've had people around them say, you know, go home and do that. Oh, oh yeah. No, this is very common, and, and this is the direction our society is going. So what I'm telling you is something that is deeply countercultural and sociologically repugnant to most of you. So we're expected to sit quietly, dab the corners of our eyes with a handkerchief, and so on. So let me tell you something. Our social conventions, this isn't even theological, our social conventions may be one of our biggest obstacles to answered prayer. Because we're too busy being white middle class, too cool for school, boardroom etiquette, and in a town like Boston with the education level that's around here and all the private equity firms and big corporations and the Harvards and the MITs and the Tufts and the, you know, just keep on going, with all of that around here, and don't forget we got Wellesley and Smith and, you know, with all of that around here, everybody knows, yeah, you better not get too riled up and people start questioning you. That's why I say you might need to put on that demeanor when you go back outside and return to normal life, but when you come in here to the prayer room, when you're, when you're getting ready to go into battle, when you're trying to find that salient point in prayer that will give you breakthrough out there, this is when you let it all hang out and get as crazy and wild as you need to be. You know, probably your Dr. Prophet from Ghana, he might know a thing or two about this. You might, you might ask him to kind of... Anyway, it's time that we unplug the wells of prayer uh, and rediscover the power of passionate, unified prayer. If we can get comfortable with that, then we may actually see the release of a lot of the things that we've been talking about, praying about, singing about, preaching about for 40 years or more. And I, I think maybe on some level the Lord's waiting for us to get focused the way David did when he realized, why, I got a problem, man. We got a whole bunch of Philistines coming to stop me right now. And, you know, we do have our own version of Philistines coming to stop us in our tracks right now. I mean, I could start listing things that are, you know, on the radar, on the horizon, that are going on in our society. I'm not going to because it's about time for me to get off this pulpit, but, but I'll just leave it at that. We need to unplug these wells of prayer. And what will be the result? Well, the place where they were praying was shaken. I mentioned that. They were all filled with the Spirit again, and they were filled with boldness. Three things shaking, filling, and boldness. Well, that's the kind of people we want to be, and that's what we want to live in. And so uh, they also prayed for signs and wonders, and those broke out in the aftermath of this prayer meeting. So here's what I propose we do, even though we're right up against the wall for time. Um, let's find a few friends. We're going to do it here. But beyond that, here's your assignment for the week. I want you to find at least two friends. You could do this on Zoom if you can't do it in person, but you'd be better to do it in person. And uh, find at least two people. And by the way, do it simultaneously, not I did it with one and then the other. And pray this way. And you can do it on the phone. Again, you can use Zoom, uh, Skype, FaceTime, whatever. Um, and I believe that we will do that. God will meet us. He will give us breakthrough in our lives. He will give us breakthrough in our region. 
This is what the Lord said. If you will ask of me, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. If he will give you the nations, he will give you this city. He will give you this region. It can be done. But the change has to happen in us. And this is yet another one of those things that we, that we have talked about this weekend. The change in us.